Thank you for joining us today for this life-changing message from River of Life. If you are ever in our area, we would love for you to join us. For more information, visit us at rolcrawfordville.com. That's rolcrawfordville.com. Or download our app in the App Store under ROL Crawfordville. Now, let's join Derek Gray as he teaches from the Word of God. Uh, hey, I mentioned uh, last week that we're going to be starting a, uh, a new study uh, the first Wednesday of April in a new book of the Bible that I've never gone through before, so uh, excited about that. But we're going to, uh, next uh, this week and the next two weeks, we've got a little bit of filler uh, we're going to do. And uh, tonight we're going to talk to you about the Trinity or the doctrine of the Trinity. Now, this is a, a complicated subject. Uh, and I know some of you that have been in church a long time, you're very familiar with the doctrine of the Trinity, uh, but I want to be mindful of the fact that there may be some people here uh, who are new to church, new to Christianity, uh, and, and maybe you don't know much about it at all, um, never even maybe heard of the term Trinity. So I'm going to try to do this at a very basic level. I first taught this lesson 15 years ago, and it took me two weeks to do it. Uh, so I've, com I've tried to uh, slim it down a little bit, simplify it, and put it into one uh, lesson. So let's start here. What is the doctrine of the Trinity? Uh, the doctrine of the Trinity is the scriptural teaching that there is one God who eternally exists as three distinct persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, there are three words there that are important. The first one is there is one God. There's not two gods or ten gods or a thousand gods. There's just one God. And this God exists, though, as three distinct persons. Not three gods, but three in one. And the word eternally is important because it's always been that way. It's not like there was one God and he decided, you know what, I'm God, I'm going to create another one. Uh, and I'll call him Jesus. That's, that's not what Scripture teaches. It's always been that way. Now, if you like diagrams or pictures, I know some people do. Uh, this is one that I've used for a long time and that I've always liked. I think it gives a good uh, description of the Trinity. Uh, there's one God. The Father is God. The Son is God. The Holy Spirit is God. And yet they are different. Uh, they are distinct. The Father's not the Son. The Son's not the Spirit. And the Spirit is not the uh, Father. Now, Again, this is not easy to understand. It can be a, a little uh, perplexing to people that hear it for the first time. Um, but we're going to try to break it down as simply as we can for you tonight. Now, before I begin, I want to I address an objection uh, that you often hear. Uh, if you ever start talking to somebody about the Trinity, sometimes you'll hear people say, well, the Trinity is not in the Bible. And, it, and what they mean by that is the word Trinity is not in the Bible. And that's true. You can go to Bible software, type in the word Trinity, and you're not going to find it in the Bible. But that's not unusual. Uh, for example, the word missionary is not in the Bible. Now, we all know what missionaries are, but the, that word missionary is not in the Bible. Now, certainly in the, in the Bible, there were missionaries. There were men like Paul and Silas and Barnabas and Mark and Timothy who went on trips and took the, uh, took the gospel to unchurched peoples and unchurched lands. Uh, back then, they just called them apostles or sent ones or messengers. Um, but today, we call them missionaries. So the word's not in the Bible. But certainly the concepts in the Bible, everybody, everybody understand that. The word rapture is not in the Bible. That may surprise some of you. It's just a term that we use. Scripture te clearly teaches us in 1 Thessalonians 4 and other places that there's coming a time when, we, there, uh, when Christians will be called up to be with the Lord in the air. We call it the rapture. The word is not in the Bible, but the, the concept is. I could go on and on. Uh, the incarnation, uh, that word's not in the Bible, but certainly the Bible teaches that God became flesh and dwelled among us in, in Jesus. So in the same way, the word Trinity is not in the Bible, but the concept or the teaching that God is three in one is certainly in the Bible. So I wanted to deal with that up front. Uh, the Trinity really is just kind of encapsulates, if you will, it's a, it's, a, it's a really simple way of encapsulating these seven statements, okay? And these seven statements are going to be key for us tonight. Uh, first of all, there is only one God. The Bible teaches that. 
uh, the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God, and then they are distinct from one another. As I said, the Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Spirit, and the Spirit is not the Father. Now, what we're going to do tonight is we're going to walk down that list, and we're going to look at every one of those statements. And if you affirm every one of those is true, then you believe in the doctrine of the Trinity. If you deny one or more of those statements, then you deny the doctrine of the, the Trinity. It's just that simple. If the Bible teaches all of those, then the Trinity is true. If the Bible doesn't teach all of those, then the Trinity is false. And we will certainly make that assessment uh, tonight. Now, before I get to there and I begin to walk down that list, I want to talk about moms and mechanics. Now, that seems weird, right? That's, that, how did you go from the Trinity to moms and mechanics? Here's why. Uh, what I don't want you guys to do tonight is check out on me, okay? Sometimes when you come to things like the Trinity uh, and you start talking about doctrine, I'm afraid some Christians just mentally check out. And, and you may be sitting there thinking, look, Derek, uh, that might be uh, fine and important for theologians and scholars and academics and teachers and preachers, but I'm just a, a normal person. I'm just a mom. I'm just a mechanic. That doesn't really matter for me. Um, and I want to tell you, nothing could be further from the, the truth. Um, do you know that you and I should expect that when we open the Bible, we should expect to find things in there that are hard to understand? You should expect that. God said this in Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways. And then he goes and gives an example. As the heavens are high above the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. Now, if that's true, if God's actions and God's thoughts and God's nature are higher than us, than the heavens are, we should expect that when we open the Bible, there are going to be things in there that are hard to understand. In fact, I often say this. If I could open the Bible and I could understand everything that was in there, I'd find it hard to believe that God inspired it. I would just think a man wrote it. But listen, if you've read the Bible like I have, there are things in there that's hard to understand. There's things that's hard to grasp. I should expect that because his ways are higher than my ways. So listen, if, if we don't understand the doctrine of the Trinity, let me just say, that's okay because it's hard to understand. If you say to me, well, I can't explain the doctrine of the Trinity, I would say to you, that's okay because it's hard to, it's hard to, it's, it's hard to explain. But what you cannot say, what you cannot say is it doesn't matter. You cannot say that. I, I want to read a quote to you uh, in just a second by A.W. Tozer. But the reason the, the doctrine of the Trinity matters is because God matters. Who God is matters more than you and I even know. I, I read this quote by A.W. Tozer 15 plus years ago, and I've never forgot it. It was in his book, The Knowledge of the Holy. He said this, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about you. It's more important than your education. It's more important than your upbringing. It's more important than, uh, than, than how much money you make. It's more important than your position. Uh, it, 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 it is the most important thing about you is what you think about when you think about God. Let me put it another way. You will never live above your belief in who God is. If, if you are an atheist and you, don't believe, you really don't believe God exists, then you'll never live above that. You'll live your life as though God doesn't exist. Does that make sense? If, you're, if you believe God exists, but you think God is some kind of petty tyrant who's walking around with a ruler and he's going to slap your hand every time you do something wrong, if that's your view of God, that's how you'll live. You'll live like a legalist. You'll have a bunch of rules, and you'll live in fear and shame and guilt, always looking for God to, to pop you on the wrist because you're doing something wrong. If that's your view of God, you'll never live above that. If you think God is love and you completely forget that he's a God of justice, and you just think, man, God loves me, and he doesn't really care what I do, and, and he just loves me like I am, and none of it really matters, listen, that's exactly how you'll live your life. You'll live a life of permissiveness and unrighteousness and you'll never rise above it because your view of God is too low. You see, how you view God has a greater impact on your life than anything else in your theology. Who do you really believe that He is? 
It, that's how important it is for us to have a high view uh, of God. You see, as Christians, we exist to honor God, to worship God, to glorify God. How well you do those things is directly related to how you view Him. Who do you think He is? So here, what I'm here tonight to tell you is it may be hard to understand, may be hard to explain, but let me tell you, it matters. It matters, not just to theologians, not just to, to scholars, not just to academics, but it matters to moms and mechanics that your view of God is as great and as glorious and as grand as the Bible says that He is. So don't check out on me tonight, okay? All right, let's turn to the Trinity. What does the Bible say? What we're going to do tonight is we're going to walk down those seven statements, and we're going to look at what the Bible says about each one of them. And remember, if you can affirm each one of those are true, then you believe in the doctrine of the Trinity. If you deny any one of those, then you deny the doctrine of the Trinity. Now, some of them I'm going to go by really quick tonight because they're pretty much, some of them are, are, are kind of a given, if you will, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them uh, because there's tons and tons and tons of scriptures. Uh, and then some I'll spend a little more uh, time on. Let's start with this first one. There is only one God. Now, again, <laughs> I'm not going to spend much time on this one. Uh, there are a multitude of scriptures in the Old Testament. There are a multitude of scriptures in the New Testament that teach us that there is only one uh, God. I'll just give you a couple from the Old and a couple from the New. Uh, Deuteronomy 6, 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Uh, Isaiah 44, 6, I am the first and the last. Besides me, there is no God. Uh, in the New Testament, James 2.19, you believe there's one God, you do well. Even the, dem even the demons believe that and tremble. And then 1 Timothy 1.17, the Apostle Paul says, To the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God. So again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that because, again, multi you know, myriad of, of scriptures that teach that. Uh, Christianity believes that. Judaism believes that. Islam believes that. Almost, you know, the vast majority of religions um, uh, believe that. So, so I think that's pretty clear. The second statement, the Father is God. Okay, again, numerous scriptures in the, uh, in the New Testament that teach us that the Father is uh, God. Let me give you a couple. These are the words of Jesus himself. Uh, John 6, 27 says, Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you for on him... God the Father has set his seal. So that is Jesus himself testifying that the Father is God. You have numerous other uh, statements, something like this in, in Paul's letter to Titus chapter 1, verse 4. To Titus, my true child, in a common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. So again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this one. A lot of scriptures that teach that. Now this is the one I'm going to spend a lot of time on. Almost everybody would agree with those first two. It's this one where the problem comes in. It's this one where false religions and false cults will always begin to separate from Christianity. Okay? And here's why. You will always see God most clearly in Jesus Christ. You want to know what God is like? You want to know what, everything about God? Look at Jesus. Listen to these scriptures right here. Colossians 1.15, He is the image of the invisible God. Hebrews 1.3, He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature. Jesus Himself said, Whoever's seen me has seen the Father. You want to know what God is like. You want to know how God thinks and acts. And, and, and look at Jesus. Just look at Jesus. That's exactly what we... This is why the enemy will always try to degrade Jesus. This is why the enemy will always try to bring him down, make him not equal with the Father, make him not unified with the Father. They, they're fine seeing him as a man or a prophet or a created being, something as long as he is not equal with God. As long as they can degrade him, you'll always have a degraded view of God the Father. So this is where cults and, and, and other People that go wrong, they will always go wrong on this one. So this is why I'm going to spend the majority of time tonight on this one. Now, the Bible teaches us that Jesus is God. 
And it does this in two ways. It does it explicitly by just coming out and saying it, but it also does it implicitly by inferring it. And I'm going to show you some examples of both of those. So here's the explicit statements. Old Testament, Isaiah 9, 6, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor. Say it with me. Mighty God. Matthew 1, 23, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son. That's Jesus. And his name shall be called Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Acts 7, 59, they stoned Stephen, and he was calling on God. And what was he saying? Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. John 20, 27 to 29, the, Jesus has been resurrected. The disciples are hiding in the room, and, and Jesus just, boom, appears in the room. And he says to Thomas, reach your finger here and look at my hands. Reach your hand here and put it in my side. Don't be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said, no, no, Thomas, hold on, buddy. You got it all wrong. He didn't say that, did he? Jesus said to him, you believe because you've seen me. Blessed are those who have not seen and have yet believed. Paul says to Titus in Titus 2.13, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Philippians 2, 6 and 7, again, Paul, who though he, talking about Jesus, was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. That word there means to be held on to. In other words, he was in the form of God. He had equality with God and he didn't hold on to it. He let it go emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. Hebrews 1.8, he's quoting Psalms 45.6. He says, but of the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. John 8, 57 to 59, the Jews said to him, you are not yet 50 years old and you've seen Abraham? And Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you before Abraham was, I am. Not I was. That's the name of God. You remember what Moses said? Who do I say sent me? He said, tell them I am that I am sent you. So when he said I am, the Jew, now listen, I hear people like argue, oh, well, he didn't mean that. And he didn't mean, folks, what do you think they thought he meant? They knew exactly what he meant because they picked up rocks to kill him. Later on in John 10, 30 to 33, Jesus said, the Father and I are one. And once again, they picked up stones to kill him. And Jesus said, at my Father's direction, I've done many good works. For which one of those are you going to stone me? And they replied, we're not stoning you for good works. We're stoning you for blasphemy because you claim to be God. They knew exactly what he said when he said, I am. They knew exactly what he was saying when he said, the Father and I are one. They, they knew exactly. We may argue about it, but they knew. Now, that's, those are just explicit statements where either the prophet calls him God or one of his disciples calls him God or, or he says himself, I'm God. But there are implicit statements as well, and I love all of these. These we overlook sometimes. But they're just, as, uh, they are, they're just as valid. Let me give you a few. In the Old Testament, in Isaiah 6, 1, very famous passage, Isaiah said this, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. Now, in the Old Testament, when you see the Lord, that means Jehovah. I saw Jehovah God sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Now, that, we all know that. that that's an incredible saying. But in John 12, the, John says this, For Isaiah said, He has blinded their hearts and hardened their heart, he's blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, lest they see with their eyes, understand with their heart, and turn and I would heal them. By the way, that's a quote from Isaiah 6. And then John says, Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and spoke of him. Joel 2.32, listen to this. This is in the Old Testament. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord, 
Jehovah shall be saved. That's Old Testament. Romans 10, 9 says this, If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. And then Paul quotes Joel 4, Whoever calls on the name of God, the Lord Jehovah, will be saved. I mean, how, how is it any clearer than that? Isaiah 44, 6, Thus says the Lord Jehovah, the King of Israel, and His Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. Now this is God speaking. I am the first. I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. Now look at Revelation 22. These are the words of Jesus. Behold, I'm coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. I am the Alpha and Omega. I am the beginning and the end. I am the first or the last. That's a statement only God makes. Isaiah 44, 8, Old Testament again, Do not fear, nor be afraid. Have I not told you from that time and declared it? You are my witnesses. Is there a God beside me? Indeed, there is no rock. I know not one. I am the only rock, God says. In 1 Corinthians 10, Paul says this, All our fathers were under the cloud, all ate the same spiritual food, and drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of the spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ Jesus. Isaiah 43, 11, again, the words of God. I, I am the Lord Jehovah, and besides me there is no Savior. Who's the only Savior? It's God, right? That's what he's saying right here. And then, of course, Luke 2, 11 says, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. Exodus 34, 14, You shall worship no other God, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Hebrews 1, 6, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all the angels of God worship him. God says, you don't worship nobody but me. And then the angels, he says, let you worship him. Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Who created the heavens and the earth? Well, according to Colossians 1, 16, it was Jesus. For by him... All things were created in heaven and earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him, for him, by him, because he's God. Let me tell you, I could go on. I I literally could do three lessons on nothing but scriptures showing that Jesus is God. He receives the honors that are due to God. We are called to love God, but then we're called to love Jesus. We, we are to pray to God, but then we're told to pray to Jesus. We are to worship God alone, but then we are to worship Jesus. We are to praise God alone, but then we're told to praise Jesus. The, the, same, the reverence that's deserved for the only God is the same reverence that's given to Him. The faith, the faith that should go to God, we're taught over and over to put our faith in in him. So he receives all of these things that belong to God. He does the works of God. We just read he's involved in creation. He sustains the universe, Colossians 1.17. He's sovereign over, na- over, over nature. He can control the wind. He can walk on water. He can turn water into wine. He can make the blind eye uh, see, the deaf ear. He can grow limbs. I mean, he, he, he is sovereign over nature. Only God has that kind of power. Of course, he is our Savior. He forgives sins, which Scripture clearly tells us only God can do. He raises the dead, and of course, he is going to judge the, the living and the dead. He is the final judge. Those are all things that's reserved for God and God alone. So he, he gets all the honor that goes to God. He, has all the, uh, the, he does the works of God. And of course, he has the attributes of God. He's unchanging. Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's eternal. Micah 5, 2, but you, Bethlehem, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from of old, from everlasting. He's not a created being. He's always existed. He has all authority. Matthew 28, 18. Jesus says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. He's all powerful. Hebrews 1, 3 says this, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and he upholds all things 
That's Jesus by the word of his uh, power. And of course, he is sinless. Hebrews 4, 15, we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. Okay? So, there's only one God. That's clear. The Father is God, and now we see that Jesus is God. Now we begin to see the issue, right? Now we begin to see that it gets complex. Let's look at the fact that the Holy Spirit is God, and then I'm going to stop and talk to you about some other uh, options. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit is equated with God. Let me give you a couple scriptures there. Acts 5.34, Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? You've not lied to men, but you lied to God. When you lied to the Holy Spirit, you lied to God. 1 Corinthians 3, 17 through 18, now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. The Holy Spirit has the same attributes as God. He is eternal. Hebrews 9, 14, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? He's omnipresent. That means he's everywhere. The psalmist says, Where shall I go from your Spirit? Where shall I flee from your presence? If I go to heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. Wherever I go, you are there. He's omniscient. He's all-knowing. 1 Corinthians 2, 10 to 11, God has revealed them to us through His Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. No one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. He's involved in all the works of God. He was involved in creation. Genesis 1, 2, the Spirit brooded over the face of the waters. He's involved in the incarnation. Uh, it says that Mary was pregnant by the Holy Spirit. He's involved in the resurrection. The same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you. And of course, he's, we are born again by the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a person. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you why I'm bringing this up because in a minute you're going to find there are people out here that say that the Holy Spirit's not a person. He's just an impersonal force. But the Scripture clearly teaches that he's a person. For example, look at 1 Corinthians 12, 11, talking about the gifts. It says, all these are empowered by one and the same, self, same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as what? As he wills. In other words, he's making the decision. He's not just some force that does what the Father tells him. He's making those choices. He's choosing who to give gifts to. The Holy, I, I'll just go through a few of these. The Spirit anointed Jesus, sent him out to preach the gospel. The Spirit testifies or witnesses of Jesus. The Holy Spirit leads God's people. He teaches us. He strives with us. He reproves us of, of sin, righteousness, and judgment. He speaks. He guides. He hears. He calls and sends forth. He settles disputes in Acts 15. The Spirit sanctifies us, comforts us, intercedes for us, and forbids us. I mean, all of these are things that, that, a, that a person would do, not a force. He has a mind, Romans 8, 27. He can be tempted and lied to, Acts 5. He can be blasphemed and sinned against, Mark 3 and Luke 12. Okay? Now, if you don't believe any of that, listen to the words of Jesus describe the Spirit. John 14, 6 and 7. Jesus says, I'll pray the Father, and He shall give you another comforter that He, not it, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it sees him not, neither knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and shall be in you. Okay? So there are the first four statements, and I'm going to pause right there. I'm going to stop for a minute. I believe Scripture clearly teaches there's only one God. It clearly teaches that the Father is God clearly teaches, abundantly teaches, that Jesus is God, and it teaches the Holy Spirit is God. But I got three more statements, and these statements are important, but I want to show you why. Let's say you're here tonight, and you say, you know, Derek, I, I just can't believe in that Trinity thing. I, it's, it's, just, it's just over my head. I just can't quite get it. I, I just don't believe it. There's got to be another explanation. Okay, I would say this to you. If you don't believe in the Trinity then how do you explain the Father and the Son and the Spirit? Who are they? 
How, how do you, how do you, cause there's certainly a father, right? And there's certainly a son and there's certainly a spirit. So what you, you tell me, what's your theology? Well, it turns out there's really only three other options. Only three other options, and I'm going to give them to you. The first one is, you can say, okay, they are three separate gods. That's an option. It's not a good option, but it, it's an option. It's not a Christian option, but it's, a, it's an option. You can believe they're three separate gods. By the way, this is what Mormons believe. This is pure polytheism. This has been around since the dawn of time, people that believe in multiple gods. Okay? Mormons believe that God the Father is the God of this planet, but they believe that there are other gods who are gods of other planets. They believe that uh, the God the Father, that's the God of this planet, He was once a man. There's a famous Mormon quote, uh, as you are, God once was, and as God is, you can be. So every, if you're a Mormon, they believe you can become a God just like so they believe the Father is, is a God, the Son is a God, and the Spirit is a God. So they believe in multiple gods. Now let me say, that's an option. It's not a Christian option. Okay? If you want to believe that, that's your business, but that's not a Christian option. Okay? Polytheism, there is only one God. Okay? So what's the second option? You say, okay, well, I can't go that because we know the Bible says there's only one God. Well, how about this one? There's really only one God, and that's the Father, and Jesus and the Spirit are not God. Okay? That's another option. By the way, that's Jehovah's Witnesses. That's a, that's a heresy that goes back to the third century. It's called Arianism. It, it tracks back to a guy by the name of Arius, and uh, th that, that's what he said. The Father is God. Jesus is not God. The Holy Spirit is an impersonal force. This is what Jehovah's Witnesses believe. They believe that God is one person. His name is Jehovah. They believe that Jesus is a created being, that God used Jesus to create the world, but prior to coming to earth, he was Michael the archangel, and uh, the Spirit is an impersonal force. So Jesus is just a created being like you and I, and the Spirit is an impersonal force. So they, that's their option. One God, the Father, and the other two are not gods. Now again, that's an option, but it ain't a Christian option. Okay, the Bible doesn't teach any of that at all, okay? Now, that brings us to the third one, and here's the third one. Now, this one's clever, okay? This is very subtle and very clever. You may say, well, how about this? There's one God, but he's tricky. <laughs> He'll manifest himself in three different modes. In other words, sometimes he's the Father, and sometimes he shows up as Jesus, and then sometimes he shows up as the Holy Spirit. One God, but he manifests in three different ways. But this is called modalism, by the way. This is the doctrine of, uh, for example, it's been around forever, but currently it's held by Oneness Pentecostals. Okay, They believe there's one God. This God is just one being. But he operates or manifests or displays himself at different modes at different times. Now, this is why this one's tricky and subtle. If you ask a modalist or a oneness Pentecostal, do you believe there's one God? They'll say yes. And then you say, do you believe the Father is God? They'll say yes. Do you believe Jesus is God? Yes. <laughs> do you believe the Holy Spirit is God? They'll say yes. But they don't believe what you believe. They believe it's one God and he's just appearing in different ways, okay? Now, that's very clever, and it's very subtle, but it is fraught with problems. Just fraught with problems. Let me give you some examples. And by the way, this is why you have to add the last three statements. The Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Spirit. The Spirit is not the Father. The Bible never teaches that God is just appearing in these different modes whenever he wants to. In fact, it teaches the exact opposite. So let me give you some scriptures. First of all, let's look at a few things where the Bible shows us that the Father is not the Son. Uh, have you, sometimes we overlook what I call greetings or salutations in, in scripture because they're all over the place. Um, but just read them sometimes and, and just look at what it says. For example, Romans 1.7. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and what? 
the Lord Jesus Christ. Now that, just in simple language, sounds like it's two people, right? It's not one person appearing, but okay, let's look at some more. Second John 1, 3, grace, mercy, and peace uh, will be with us from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Father's Son. Again, it certainly just sounds like they're talking about two different persons. Here's the important one. There are multiple scriptures in, and stick with me for just a second, there are multiple scriptures in the Old Testament and the New Testament that talks about under Jewish law, you had to have two witnesses to make something true. You couldn't just testify in court and have one witness. You had to have two. Everybody with me? Listen to the statement of Jesus and listen very carefully to what he says. John 8, 17 and 18. In your law, he says, it is written that the testimony of two people is true. I, Jesus says, I'm the one who bears witness about myself and the father who sent me bears witness about me. Now, folks, if modalism is true and there's only one God and he just appears sometimes as a father and sometimes as a son, then that's a lie. That's a lie. Are you with me? Because Jesus is saying, I testify to who I am. The Father testifies, therefore my witness is true. But if, if it's the same person just appearing, then that's, a, that's an outright lie. You remember what we started out by saying, how that they, they always attack Jesus because it brings your view down of God? You see, if you believe that, and you read something like that, you think, boy, that, that Jesus is tricky. If you believe that way, I'll go on. I won't cover all this. We got multiple scriptures where the Father sent the Son. We got scriptures where the Father and Son love each other. They speak to each other. They know each other. Uh, he, 1 John tells us that Jesus is our advocate with the Father. I mean, multiple scriptures that tell us they're different. Uh, the Son and the Father are not the Spirit. Let me give you a few of these. Jesus said this, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. 2 Corinthians 13, 14, Paul says, May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. 1 Peter 1, 2, Chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ and, by, and sprinkling by His blood. Here's, if you don't catch any of the others, this is the words of Jesus. This is the words of Jesus, John 14, 16 to 18. I, Jesus, will ask the Father, and He'll give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth. So Jesus is saying there's three of us. There's me, there's the Father, And there's a spirit. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm going to believe him. If Jesus says there's three of them, I'm going to believe there's three of them. I don't believe he's playing a trick on me. I don't believe he's being deceptive. Anything, I'm just going to believe what he says. Here's another one, John 15, 26. But when the helper comes, who I will send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father. So right there in one statement, you got the Father, you got the Son, and you got the Holy Spirit. Again, I'm just going to accept Jesus' words and, and, and not go too far there. Here's the, here's the biggie to me that kind of cements it all together. This is the baptism of Jesus in Luke chapter 3. It says, Jesus had also had been baptized and was praying, and the heavens were open, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove, and a voice came from heaven saying, You are my beloved Son. With you I am well pleased. I just don't know how somebody can... If you believe in modalism, by the way, <laughs> how, do you, how do you deal with that? I mean, how do you deal with that? Is, what's he doing? Is he throwing his voice? I mean, what's he doing here, right? And, and, and again, the point comes back is that, that unless there's three people, this, is, this would be pure and out deception if there's only one God, one God and who's manifesting himself in three different ways. Like I said, I don't believe any of that. I just believe what the Bible says. At the end of the day, if you look at Scripture, all seven of those are attested to and affirmed by Scripture. And as I said when we started, if you believe all seven of those and you believe Scripture teaches those, then you affirm the doctrine of the Trinity. Okay, And just a very simple way, as we round out one more time to say it, there's one God who eternally exists as three distinct persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, do I understand that? No. 
I, I can't understand it because his ways are higher than me. But I believe him. I believe his son. I believe the spirit who confirms the word in my heart. I believe that is absolutely 100% true, even though I will never be able to grasp it with my human mind. And that's okay. That's okay. But it matters. My God is high and lifted up, man. And I want to strive to be faithful to him and to honor him and to worship him and to glorify him for who he is. I'm not going to put him in my little box so my little mind can somehow grasp it. I'm going to back off and fall at his feet and say, I, I honor you for who you are. That's, what, that's why the Trinity uh, matters. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we love you. We thank you for, for your word. We, we know that this is a, is, a, is a complex thing. You're a complex, uh, you're a complex God. But Lord, you have revealed yourself in Scripture uh, clearly, and we accept you for who you are. We believe your word, God. We believe that you are a triune God, and we glorify you for that. We honor you for that. Father, if there are those in the midst of us, if there are those for friends and family who are struggling with this and, 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 and seeing God as something lesser, somehow, some way, Holy Spirit, will you do a work in their heart? to confirm your majesty, to confirm that your son is not a created being, that your son isn't just a man or a prophet, but he is God, God who came and died on a cross for our sins. And may they fall and worship him for who he is in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you again for watching our message from River of Life. If this message has touched you today, or if you need someone to pray with, please contact our office at 850-926-1200 or email us at info at rolcrawfordville.com. We also want to encourage you to visit us Sunday mornings at 1030 or Wednesdays at 7 p.m. Please visit us at rolcrawfordville.com for more information and direction.